Welcome to the Clean Power Hour Live. I'm Tim Montague, your host. Today on the Clean Power Hour, nuclear power, it's not as effective as some people think it is. And we're going to talk about that. Uh, effective meaning decarbonizing the grid. CATL unveils, unveils EV battery enabling 400 kilometer driving range on a 10 minute charge. Holy moly. And Nextera has a 250 gigawatt pipeline with almost 150 gigawatts of secured interconnection over 20 gigawatts of capacity in their construction backlog. Yeah, Nextera is the largest solar developer in America. That is a fact. Welcome to the show by co-host and the commercial solar guy, John Weaver. Welcome. Hey, Tim. How you doing? Hope the, hope the times are going nice. And yeah, uh, Nextera has a 250 gigawatt pipeline of projects. And I'm not sure how to emotionally react by that, react to that. But I just thought that we should all talk about it. And there's something else interesting about their giant pipeline, is that they also own a transmission company. I covered their quarterly earnings recently, and their transmission company says, "Hey, sometimes when transmission we can't get our projects built because the grid's bad, then we'll just build our own power lines because we own a power transition transmission company." So. That just made me feel really jealous and, you know, envious of Next Era and their giant pipeline. So that's, you know, why that one got on the list. I, I hope everybody else is doing well this week and building solar. Tim, uh, anything interesting going on for you? Well, I just uh, moderated a panel on energy storage, grid scale energy storage with Duke Energy, ESS that's Inc. Cool. That makes a iron flow battery and a energy developer called Grid Store. So looking forward to... Um, bringing more about that to our audience and to the readers of PV Magazine. I've started to write some articles for PV Magazine, yeah. as you noted on LinkedIn this week, John, and it's it's really fun. I, I don't know why I stayed on the sidelines so long, but um, I want to remind our listeners that you can find all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. That's our main website. We're posting two interviews, or the, this news roundup and an additional interview. So we post two shows a week. The, the pre-recorded interviews drop on Tuesdays, and then we do this live on Thursday, and then the recording is uh, promoted on Friday. But the best place to catch the live is on YouTube. We promote it also on Facebook and LinkedIn. But just FYI, I think the user experience is best on YouTube. And I want to give a shout-out to Joe Scharf for being here and also for being on the webinar on uh, energy storage. So that was interesting. Um, you know, the, the uh, right now, energy storage in North America, John, is experiencing a boom. And that's mostly lithium uh, technology. And, and there's a double edge with lithium, right? There's safety concerns, there's thermal runaway concerns, there's supply chain concerns. And then and, and that's short duration, and it's very good for what it does, right? Um, but let's face it, 70% of those cells are made overseas. And so from a national security perspective, we might want to consider leaning into some other things. Um, iron flow, for example, or iron air. I wrote a story about Form Energy. Uh, they released a white paper recently where they point out that, you know, we can reduce the cost of grid energy for New Yorkers by 29% if you would adopt our iron air technology. Now they're biased, they're promoting their certain technology, but that kind of long duration energy storage based on iron, it's a rust battery, what, what Form Energy is doing, which is fascinating. I, 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 want to, I want to see with a microscope inside how it charges and discharges, right? Because it's, it's taking iron, it's, it's converting it to rust, just by oxidizing it and then vice versa and in that process electrons either fly on or fly off the the materials it's, it's quite fascinating but i don't really understand how that works um but anyway and then on that on the lithium front canary media published a story this week about fires uh there were three fires with with grid scale energy deployments in new york state which left the governor governor hochul Kind of scrambling to assure New Yorkers that batteries are safe, and every fire is a black eye on the industry. And we n nobody likes thermal runaway in their in their battery project. One of those was owned by Nixera, though. That was one of the things that reminded me 
of that story because Nextera is also doing large scale storage deployments. But what are your perspectives on, on uh, battery energy storage, John? So right now I'm writing a story for PV Mag, um, reviewing a, a release by the American Clean Power Society or Ameri ACP, American Clean Power. And I'm covering just some reviews. It, they're they're uh, best practices by first responders uh, for energy storage thermal incidents. And um, <clears throat> I think, you know, we're, we're going to have to get good at batteries. There's already thousands and thousands of systems, tens of thousands. I don't know if we're in the millions of batteries, individual battery systems deployed across the nation. But we do have a lot. And we're going to have incidents. Uh, we need to figure out how to minimize them. Um, you know, we often mention that lithium, uh, so there's different mixes of lithium ion batteries. So lithium with nickel and cobalt is more flammable maybe than um, lithium phosphates because of an oxygen thing. However, some of the batteries in New York were lithium phosphate batteries. So while they have less risk than the lithium ion, they have lithium phosphate. They, they still do burn. So it's it's a thing we're going to have to learn and get good at, and we're going to have to deal with it and learn how to manage it. You know, I hear that the number of car fires we have per year is so huge that we've just become numb to it. Uh, we can't become that way with batteries. It would really upset me if uh, if we became that way with batteries because because we shouldn't. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. This document that I'm covering, it says that one of the there's a there's a evolving strategy right now with how to manage batteries and i guess i'll go into this next week after i pub the article but one of the schools of thought is called the make it burn let it burn thought where once the thing starts burning you need to let it burn to zero and you need to maybe even if an event occurs that destroys a chunk of it you need to f make it burn so it's it's let it burn make it burn and the make it burn out logic is interesting because there's a discussion about fire suppression systems in lithium ion, whether you should have them or not, or whether you should have the inverse of a fire suppression system. I learned this this morning, Tim. So yeah, fire I, accelerator. You know, it's interesting. Yes, sir. Interesting idea. I mean, these some of these fires have burned for several days, right? They are difficult to put out because lithium is so reactive. And it, it, it can react with water, in fact. If you take a piece of pure, my understanding is if you take pure lithium and drop it in a glass of water, it'll burst into flames or explode. Um, and so you think about putting out a lithium fire, it's not a matter of pouring water on it. You've got to pour other things on it. And you know, you're, you're trying to prevent oxygen from being available because that is one of the things it's reacting with, at least I think it is. And oxygen is very reactive, just as lithium is, and, and, and then you get this thermal runaway. But um, I want to put the story that I wrote on screen. And, you know, the title here is Multi-Day Energy Storage Increases Grid Capacity by Factor of 10. What that's referring to is a comparison that Form did, Form Energy, uh, which has a uh, long-duration iron-air battery. That's the photo. That's uh, so cool. It is extremely cool. It looks. It, this looks like a NASA photograph, actually. I, I hope it's not that far out. Like I hope this is is more real. I mean, they have announced deployments now in three states: Colorado, Minnesota, and now New York, where they just won a twelve million dollar grant from NYSERDA. Notably, they sopped up twelve million of this seventeen million dollar program. And kudos to NYSERDA for feeding the market and seeding the market. This is so important for government to do this so that we can get these deployments on the ground and really start trying this technology out and see if it's going to give the grid what it says it could do. But what's interesting about this 100-hour duration storage is they found that when they compared that to the alternative of just doing a bunch more lithium batteries, okay, that, yeah, you can deploy gigawatts of lithium um, around 40 gigawatts, right? But, oh, sorry, it would be 60, if you wanted to solve the problem with short duration batteries, it would be 60 gigawatts of battery capacity, okay? But that only gives you 538 gigawatt hours of energy storage versus this iron air technology, which you would only deploy 40 gigawatts, but you get 5,000 gigawatt hours out. And really, those 5,000 gigawatt hours is what really is going to make a difference, right? We've we, we have an estimate, I think, from BNEL, 
Berkeley National Laboratories that um, we need six terawatt hours of storage on the grid by 2050 to clean the grid. So we're talking terawatt scale uh, batteries on the grid. Um, so, so anyway, this was a compelling white paper and I look forward to getting feedback from our listeners about what they think about Iron Air. I, there was a comment about uh, somebody waiting in the wings to see how iron technology uh, evolves. And um, yeah, I, this is Rick saying, I'm waiting for full deployment. Um, I'm not sure what that means. To develop, fully developed. Fully developed iron batteries for their cheap common components. Um, you know, iron is super abundant in the Earth's crust. So anyway, uh, it's, it's, a, it's kind of an apples and oranges situation today. The, the lion's share of batteries going on the grid, whether that's behind the meter or for grid scale, is lithium. And that's because of the economics. Um, and, and they're just hard to beat right now. But then there's this longer, uh, bigger picture, you know, where we're replacing peaker plants and coal and natural gas plants, right, with big batteries and solar arrays and wind farms. And we're going to need other technologies. And it just makes sense to me that if we can deploy stuff that we can make easily here in the U.S., we want to do that. Uh, form. I'm starting to warm up to them. Um, you're, uh, as you mentioned, they have projects that seem to be moving forward in at least three states now. And they have a factory that's being constructed in uh, West Virginia. <clears throat> um, I, I'm, I'm really interested actually in reading this paper and understanding the benefit. I, I mean, I get that they have a greater capacity, 5,000 gigawatt hours versus 538 gigawatt hours. But you know, going from 538 to 5,000, five terawatt hours, that's yep. a lot of money because, you know, 538 gigawatt hours is $400 per kilowatt hour. But for Form Energy, they're probably in the 1500 to $2,000 per, um, uh, well, actually, no, they, they suggest that they'll be down to 10 to $20 per gigawatt hour. So, so if it's a 10x you know, as we say, as I say it out loud, if it's a 10x price for lithium ion over form, mm -hmm. form will give you 10x capacity. Yeah, I, I, there is maybe. The I mean, a, there is yeah. a somewhat level playing field there. Yeah, and I, I hope, I hope it works. I, I was super surprised with the the when I saw that image. The reason I said it was so cool, I was super surprised at it. I was expecting some giant vat of liquid or something, but it's really these little slots. And you can just pull one in, pull one out. But it, it may not be that easy, but I bet you they're going to manufacture the heck out of these units and slowly get smarter in how they do it. And I bet these individual, um, uh, I guess, uh, blades, which reminds me very much of data centers, I bet you these individual blades can just be pulled out and slid back in and you can just replace them if they need repair. So I'm... I'm, I'm getting warmer on form. I like the idea. I still want to see us better grasp um, uh, long duration or because it's it's going to be we, we need to figure out how to pay them properly. Right now we bid on like an hourly basis, a minute by minute basis. Well, maybe these guys will bid on a minute by minute basis in the same way and take over long chunks of it. But I'm just super interested in seeing them on the grid and starting to do stuff and and one way or another, we got to like bootstrap them as a nation to help them just get stuff out there so we can run it, become trusting of it and seeing what happens. Um, yeah, cool. Great job, Form. Cool, cool article. I like reading your articles, Tim. Well, I've been reading yours for three years, so it's, it's, it's you know, you, you've got some catching up to do. Well, I guess I have some catching up to do because I have to write them first. Yes. Um, well, let's talk about nuclear power. It is one of my favorite topics. And as our listeners know, I live in Illinois, which is the most nuclearized state in the United States. And if you say nuclear, I consider you to be an ignoramus. I'm sorry, but you have to say nuclear. Um, that is the correct pronunciation in case you were wondering, John. But um, no, there's some nuclear. research. There's some research that just came out of uh, Sweden, of all places. The Stockholm School of Economics and the European Environmental Bureau did an analysis of nuclear uh, energy. And right now, in the United States, there is a movement uh, headed by the DOE. And I will note that the DOE gave 
uh, the, the Vogel project in Georgia, which is our most recent nuclear power plant that's come online. Uh, that, that plant's been running for some years, but then they did an expansion. And the expansion was a boondoggle economically, but they gave them $5 billion in loans, the DOE did. So that's an example. And then they're also very much pushing next generation small modular nuclear reactors Check out my interview with Dave Kraft at the Nuclear Energy Information Service on our channel at cleanpowerhour.com, where we talk about the good, bad, and ugly of SMNRs. And SMNRs have been a thing, right, for decades because we run nuclear submarines and nuclear uh, aircraft carriers, right, on those uh, reactors. They are real. They're legitimate technologies. I'm not questioning that whatsoever. But the rate at which you can deploy it and the cost of the energy is really the, the deal kicker um, or the deal breaker here. And they concluded, you know, these Europeans, they're very savvy. Uh, they, they live in the future, John. In case you want to go to the future, just go to northern Europe. It's, it's really cool um, because they've, they've adopted clean energy technologies faster than we have in the U.S. because energy is so freaking expensive in Europe. It, we're talking four to ten times as much as you and I pay. And that's kind of across the board, whether it's fossil or other technology. So anyway, they concluded that this is not going to be good for decarbonizing the economy. That's kind of the bottom dollar here. And they say that researchers show that in terms of cost and speed, renewable energy sources have already beaten nuclear and that each investment in new nuclear plants delays decarbonization compared to investments in renewable energies. So that's kind of my point of view here is if we're going to make the energy transition as quickly as possible, we don't have time for nuclear. I don't doubt it's going to be great for Elon Musk's, um, you know, base on Mars. And, and I look forward to seeing Elon on Mars. Um, but <laughs> what do you think about nuclear, John? I like nuclear. I think nuclear is cool. The only negative, there's two negative things about nuclear. One is that it's not getting built. I mean, that's it. That's the number one thing. It's not thing. getting it's going, built fast anyway. It's yeah. It's not getting built. It's in terms of the global cut of electricity. Nuclear used to be at like eighteen percent. It's now going down, 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 and it's under nine, under ten percent, gaining on nine percent. In a time when we need nuclear, it's going the other direction. So. I'm sorry, that's that's my number one attack on nuclear. My number two attack on nuclear are the people that are nuclear proponents. They're absolutely obnoxious. Um, but that's, you know, that's not nuclear power plants fault. That's just the internet and how we're all a bunch of weirdos sometimes. So the 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 we got to build nuclear. I mean, if we're going to I mean, there was this massive celebration at this power plant coming on in Georgia. And it's the first new power plant to start in 30 years. I mean, this is nukes used to be like 22 24 25 30 percent of u.s electricity i don't know what they were back in the 80s but now they're under 20 they're like 17 18 maybe with vogel turning on they're back to 19. wonderful but uh, we need the nukes but i i just i can't believe in them i can't trust in them in the long term because of where we're at and you know uh, right now new nuclear in the u.s is lower probability than um, Tim Latimer at uh, uh, Fervo Energy deploying massive uh, uh, geo uh, geothermal. And so if I'm going to have an emotion right now about a new technology, it's Tim and his geothermal at Fervo. And yeah, sure, I want the nuclear. Build it, build it, build it. Or, at minimum, don't shut it off. Please don't shut off our nuclear power plants. But quit pounding on the table and telling me how nuclear runs when the sun goes down. Because nobody cares what's happening when the sun goes down if there's no nuclear plant. You know, batteries and solar and wind wouldn't need to exist if nuclear had maxed out the grid. And it didn't. Right. And so now we're here in 2023 and shit's happening and we need to build stuff. So, great. Love nuclear. Bah. And to your point, once you build the plant, it makes a lot of sense to keep it running. And that's what we're doing in Illinois. All of our energy legislation, FIJA and CJA now, from the last five years, also provides incentives for the nuclear industry because the economics of those plants are bad. Uh, the operators want to shut them down. And 
Um, and so the state has given them a handout in the form of ZEX. So just like we have Rex in, in renewable energy, they have ZEX in uh, nuclear stands for zero energy carbon credits. And it keeps the plant running. And that's good because it it is a big plant. We're talking gigawatt scale. Um, now, the, the other concerns I have about nuclear, and then we'll move on, are the cost overruns. And this story in PV Magazine t from today points out that all of the projects, I think 97% of the projects in the world that they analyzed had experienced cost, cost overruns, and the cost overruns are over 100%. So the project, for example, they gave an example from Finland. They predict the first cost was three billion, and then the real cost was 11 billion, more than 3x, almost 4x. And Georgians are paying for the cost overruns of Vogel, right? Every Georgian has on their power bill a a fee to pay for Vogel because of it, it was a financial debacle. And then the nuclear waste. We still haven't figured out what to do long term with our nuclear waste. I disagree it, with that. We know what to do with it. We're just a bunch of pansies. And we whine about stuff, and we don't want to deal with it. None of us want it in our backyard. We're smart. We have many places we could put it. We might make mistakes, but I don't know. I disagree with that statement. Well, we need to put it deep inside a mountain somewhere, but getting it to that mountain and getting that mountain approved has, been, has proven to be quite difficult. And so as a result, the nuclear waste is piling up on site. And that's my backyard, bro. I live yeah. 50 miles from a nuclear power plant called Clinton Power Station, and... The on-site storage is, is made to be temporary, not permanent. And so we do need to find a solution for the long-term waste, which is radioactive for hundreds or thousands of years. And, well, it's definitely radioactive for thousands of years. Is it dangerously radioactive for thousands of years is a question I, I don't know. I'm not a nuclear physicist. Anyway, all right. No new nukes is my mantra today. I love that mantra. Ah, no terrible. new nukes. More wind, batteries, and what? Solar. Of course. Solar. We like solar. We like solar. <laughs> All right. What's next up, John? Uh, Cadle and their constant battery oh, advancements, uh, which are really cool. Very interesting story. Now, here, I have a question. And I, and this wasn't brought up by me. This was brought up by others. But I just want to see your and maybe anybody else's perspective. So, so if the car can get from 0 to 80% and, you know, add 80 kilowatt hours during that window... It's going to need like a one megawatt charger. Are we really going to have one megawatt chargers for our cars or 500 kW, 750 kW chargers for our cars? We might because we're going to start building them for big trucks and big things. And they're going to be around. Like I hear that the, the what, the mega truck, um, not the mega, the pickup truck. Uh, cyber truck? Cyber truck, geez. I hear the cyber truck's going to have a really fast charge rate, like a 750 or something goofy. Or at least the ability. So yeah. to charge a battery this big in 10 minutes, you're going to need a way high charging infrastructure. So maybe the reality is that we would say that we're reaching the point where batteries are no longer the bottleneck for charging. And the world should start to shift to energy delivery techniques, which we already talk about a lot. But that's what I really am starting to take from what's happening with the batteries. I think the charge rate will no longer be an issue as we learn and eventually we'll plug our cars into whatever the heck we want and shoop, it'll just be full in five so minutes. The, the title of this story by Valerie Thompson in PV Magazine is CATL unva unveils EV battery enabling a 400 kilometer driving range on a 10 minute charge. Yeah. That is incredible, right? Yeah. Like if you, would, when I owned my Tesla, it would take at least half an hour to get four, you know, 300 miles of range. Um, at least, right? And and now they're 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 squishing this by a factor of three. Um, that's amazing. What is the technology though that they're uh, that they're using here? Is this some exotic lithium technology or what is it? Um, this is just oh, lithium iron phosphate. Yeah, this is their standard product. This is like what they do. You know, I, uh, I don't think it's any magic. It doesn't exist yet, but they're. This is Cato, man. They're, they're, they are the leading battery company, I think, in the world. I mean, BYD might be behind them but uh, and Tesla, mm -hmm. but I really, I mean, a lot of these cells, Cato's cells are in Tesla vehicles because Tesla hasn't scaled fast enough to feed all their stuff. So this is standard battery product. Like, in fact, they think this type of product is close to market. 
versus a lot of people who announced their headline saying, hey, we did this. And, you know, just coming from this company, it's much more real than any of the other headlines I see from the cooler, from the other companies announcing breakthroughs like this. Like, for instance, when Toyota says it, it's not real because apparently Toyota has been talking about super high charging and all kinds of stuff for like 20 years. So I, I guess I've, I've been taught not to accept Toyota headlines, but these guys and their, and you know, Elon Musk, his headlines are real too in the year 2027 to 2029. Um, and they will be real, but Cato, they're going to say a headline. And then a month later, they're gonna be like, Oh, here's one of the cars with the technology in it. And then a year later, it's going to be in a whole bunch of cars. So I'm just, I like watching this, man. We're, we are in the midst of the early stages of the energy storage, not the early stages, maybe the middle of the energy storage for vehicle evolutions to occur. Like it's happening all around us. The factories are scaling. More people that are intelligent are putting their eyes on it. More and more is happening surrounding um, car batteries with all these factories and all these manufacturers. We're going to keep seeing this come out. Bam, bam, bam. And it's going to be like, oh, I didn't think that was possible. All the people from 2016 who are really smart and who we listen to, Tim, because they are the smart people, they're all wrong. They're like, they're way behind what turned out to be real. Everybody's like, oh, you'll never charge fast because lithium's so unstable. Well, you're wrong. We figured it out. Uh, we just needed to pour, you know, $50 billion on it and a whole bunch of human brains just staring at it. And man, it's coming. We're, we're in the midst of it. Appreciate this, Timothy. You are watching a revolution. Yes. And to answer your question, it says the Chinese battery manufacturer produced 37% of the world's electric vehicle batteries. Just Ooh. one manufacturer, CATL. They are the largest battery maker in the world. And earlier this year, we reported on their story about this 500 watt hour per kilogram technology that mm -hmm. they're promoting for electrification of, of air travel. Mm -hmm. uh, electric airplanes are real. Of course, they're you know, initially going after short distance and then medium distance, you know, countries like Norway have set a path to having pure electric airplanes for regional air travel within country by 2030. That's only seven years away. It's coming. And that'll be massive for decarbonizing transportation. Um, the, you know, uh, uh, gosh, good. Th it's, it's such a weird world that we live in, John, because there so many good things are happening, right? But by the same token, we see the writing on the wall that climate change is going to be a brutal force for humanity, right? The heat waves, the fires, the floods, um, it's, it's gnarly. And say la vie, though. Like, living 500 years ago was no walk in the park either. I've been listening to Dan Carlin's podcast. If you ever want to geek out on ancient history, check out Dan Carlin's hmm. podcast. If you just Google it, Dan Carlin with a C. Um, he, he 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 goes to town on ancient history and it was a short brutal life it really was um so climate change is going to be intense it's going to be tough but human humanity will survive it it's just a question of can we maintain this good like cakewalk of a life that we have that fossil fuels gave us right fossil fuels have been a dream for humanity and now we have technologies to supplant them, and we need to deploy those as quickly as possible. Um, I'm, I'm in a big uh, push of history reading these days. I'm, I've been recently focusing on my European history, Timothy. Uh, I'm enjoying seeing various sprigs of uh, the modern political economic structure. We're seeing uh, modern liberty advance, the ideas of it coming from the Holy Roman Empire, seeing early sparks of capitalism from the Dutch and the English. Anyway, that's enough for that, Tim. Uh, but uh, thank you for bringing up history stuff because I'm, I'm super excited with my little books that I'm reading. And uh, yeah. the Holy Roman Empire is a pretty interesting legal structure of sorts that existed. So, so I don't know. there you go. Hey, you, wrote a, you wrote a story mm -hmm. about Norsun. Now we reported yes. on Norsun last week. Is this a, oh. is this the same this exact is... story or just a, a? No, it must have gotten copied over because I was super excited about it. Okay. If we reported on Norsun, yeah, because this is this is the Norsun where I wrote my article on it. Maybe yeah. I uh, wrote I the think article we covered afterwards. It last week, it is a good story. Five gigawatts of wafer facility coming to the U.S. for Meyer Burger. 
Um, but just go to go to Clean Power Hour. Check out the live from last week. I think. Yep. Let's go to the uh, nacelle story or it's, nacelle. It's, is it nacelle? I want to be right in my pronunciation since I made a point about nuclear today, John. Well, don't worry. The Europeans will make fun of your accent. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> is it nacelle or nacelle? I don't know. Don't ask me. I say nacelle. Oh, come on. You're the English major, aren't you? Yeah. No, political science. Political oh, science. Come okay. on. Yes. So uh, this is just, it's not a story. It's just me driving by, you know, once a week on Wednesdays, I go down to uh, my uh, company's other office and I'm just driving by the um, Vineyard Wind staging ground. And if you look at the image, you can see that there's two gentlemen on a lift, well, two workers on a lift yep. and they're right up next to the unit and yep. you can see their size relative to the unit. And the fact that this is like two or three times the size of a school bus. <laughs> and these guys are right next to it. In fact, they're slightly closer, so they should even be bigger, which means this thing might be a little bit smaller. Um, and I, we were just driving by. I was in the car with my residential manager, Adam Jett. We were uh, just cruising up and down the uh, water, wanted to go see it. You can see the monopiles in the back that are stacked. And it was just seeing a human being next to the unit was just cool. And so I we'll have to see the if, picture. Uh, we'll have to see if we can get you a press pass to that offshore wind conference that's coming to Boston this fall. Isn't there one in there? I think in November. Oh, that'd be sweet. I mean, October or November. I'll 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 file an application just to see. I don't know. I don't think I can go, but uh, maybe you could. Yeah. Well, if it's in Boston, I'm nearby. It's your backyard. It's 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 yeah. It is. I mean, I can throw rocks at Boston from my apartment. So so yeah. I just thought it was cool. It's just big. There's people there and. You know, I get to drive by and see it all the time. So, so that's uh, that's our project. Now there is some complexity ongoing with the uh, um, <clears throat> uh, offshore wind and mass. There was just a contract that was canceled for a really big project because the price was bid low, and the manufacturer said, "Listen, we can't deliver it what we wanted." So the plan is to renegotiate the price. Oh, fingers crossed, man. But you know, let's. You know they canceled it and we're moving forward with it which is good the state is the department of Eng uh, department of energy and resources doer recommended the cancellation the state accepted the cancellation hopefully everybody's agreeable on the new numbers and we can continue on because it was like a 1.2 gigawatt wind facility so we don't want to lose out on 1.2 gig facilities and i think there were two of them that w uh, requested a renegotiation so Mm. we shall see um what's going to yeah. come next from it so yeah. so wind wind is doing some stuff uh, a second wind farm i believe has kicked off uh construction or given final approval in rhode island and so or maybe it's the first one but the second one in the region so there's a 704 ish megawatt connecticut slash rhode island wind farm that's uh starting construction which is now cool that means you know we have at least two facilities being built at the same time that's some that's some neatness so I have a question. I'm working on a story on the long-term cost of energy and, you know, bringing down the cost of, of utility solar, for example, unlocks things like uh, large-scale green hydrogen. But so I was, I was looking at Lazard. They do this, you know, annual report on the mm -hmm. LCP. And the, the, the 2023 report said that solar is now on par at $24 per gigawatt hour. Uh, with wind, with onshore wind. Do you know what that figure is for offshore? Because I didn't notice that or didn't see that. I'm just curious, what is the delta? Offshore is obviously more expensive, but it's trade-off because you can get a lot more energy per megawatt because the capacity factor is going to be higher. You know, I think, for example, 20, we estimate 25% capacity factor for onshore here in the Midwest, onshore wind, whereas offshore, it's more like 40 or 50%, isn't it? Yeah, it depends. Yes, but yes, it can be that big. Um, you know, this these facilities in mass are expected to be upper 40s, um, maybe mm. even in 50s. Yeah. Um, but offshore wind, you know, I just opened up the Lazard thing real quick, and uh, utility scale, solar storage, and offshore wind's more expensive. Okay, so we do have offshore wind in the document and levelized, high end, low end. So offshore wind, we're talking. Uh, 42 wind plus storage offshore wind offshore $72 per kilowatt hour so pricing for offshore wind is is decently more expensive wind onshore per megawatt hour yeah That'd per megawatt, megawatt hour 
Yeah, so wind onshore, 24 to 75. Wind offshore, um, ah, that's without PTCs. Okay, sensitive carbon pricing, unsubsidized analysis. Here we go. Wind offshore, 72 to 140. So 7.2 cents to 14 cents. Wind onshore, 24 to 75. Utility scale solar onshore or utility scale solar 24 to 96 at the high end. So offshore wind starts at 72, goes up to 14 cents per kilowatt hour. So it's it's a chunk more expensive still. Cool. Well, let's talk about this phenomenon. I'm not sure what to call it. You have a story on LinkedIn. Today we turned on our cellular modem for OptConnect and we're able to remote into our SMA technology inverter for the first time. What a wonderful vision we are blessed with. <laughs> question mark? Yes, yes. You, Is there were, a question you, were underwhelmed? you were underwhelmed by the option? No, no, no. There, you Optimum. know what? Here, you know, we, I know I was totally excited about it. And the question mark on the uh, was, a, was a mistake. Here, you know what? I'm going to edit that right now. That's not a question mark. Edit post. That's an exclamation point. What a wonderful vision we are blessed with. See, punctuation matters, Tim. It's been updated. Um, so yeah, I like the I, little speedometer showing you what the uh, cap, you know the the current capacity of the array is. Yeah, um, that's just a standard SMA login. This is our Tioga Downs product project. So this is a uh, the commercial solar guy project of the week, and we have two units there that are turned on, two 125s, and they were both maxed out. And so I was just excited because. This is the first time I got to log in and see it. The on-site people could tell that it was working, and so everybody knew it was working. But me, logging in remote, this is the first time. And I also wanted to say uh, that OpConnect has a cool little package. And I, that's why I wrote on our document the product slash, slash project of the week. Because OpConnect has a, um, a modem, a cellular modem, that comes in an enclosure. And everything is wired. And all you have to do is plug in your Cat5 cables from your units, and the modem automatically just turns on. Now you have to do you you do have to call um, uh, OptConnect in order to get into your unit, so that you might have to like do this little VPN thing. But I just thought it was really neat that they sent me an enclosure. Everything was pre-wired. We sent it straight to the electrician who did all the work on the site. And he knew exactly how to install it. Was no challenges. The only thing we had to do is learn about the backend walkthrough process, adjust the um, the internet settings in the modems, uh, and turn off automatic DHCP, getting rid of automatic IP addresses. One or two very simple clicks, and then boom, I had remote access. Now the reason the remote access was important is because the project is going to have a big battery attached, and the battery's not there yet. The battery has massive monitoring and all kinds of control systems, so it's going to know everything that's going on. But in the interim, we just needed the solar to be running to take care of the customer. We didn't want it wasting its life, and I wanted to watch it before we have this, like, you know, half a million dollar battery showing up from Enion. Um, and so just being able to see this and send it to the customer and it happening so easy and smoothly was just cool. And so I got to say thank you, uh, OptConnect for your cellular modem in a box. Oh, and they rent it. They let you rent a modem for, you know, X time period while you're getting the rest of your system up. So it was just a cool product. I was happy to have experienced it and learned how to use it. And even my electrician was uh, happy about it. He wrote back, he goes, hey, that was exciting work to do. It's the first time I've ever set one of these up this way. Thanks for teaching me something. So that was, everybody was, you know, feeling cool about it. So, so that. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about ingot manufacturing. Uh, I assume this refers to ingots used in solar cells. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Our build manufacturing introduces solar ingot processor. The Massachusetts-based company developed the RBM 600 Solar CZ puller to produce high purity polysilicon ingots for solar panels. Cool. And the neatest part for me was that it's in Massachusetts. So that means, and Framingham, I think, which is 30 minutes away. So I'm totally going to ask my girlfriend to go there with me and be a nerd next to me while I try to touch things. Uh, their website seemed cool. They build a lot of stuff. 
and I just and it doesn't. I'm not sure if this unit exists yet because they're so far all the images I've seen are just uh, reproductions. But I just think it's cool that it's right down the street from me. I've never had a solar ingot pulling manufacturer right down the street from me. I think I saw a email about a webinar that PB Magazine is hosting on this topic. Also, or the topic is manufacturing, but I, I saw this photo in the email. So. Uh, I, I think apparently RE Build is going to be featured in that webinar, so look for that. Um, yeah, it's a funky looking machine. It kind of looks like a furnace combined with a steam engine. <laughs> All right, nice, 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 nice mix of everything. We'll go for it. Yeah, I, I think it's neat. So so what this is doing is that it's, it's a puller. So there's a, a bunch of melted poly from electric. Um, well, this is relatively clean poly if it's in New England, but who knows where they'll be installed. But the uh, the puller pulls the poly up through the machine, and I don't know any of the technicals, but it pulls it up through this big tube, and it makes that straight ingot. And so they crystallize as they do that, and the mono product has a, a bigger crystal. Uh, I did write them um, at the location or on their website and said, hey, per ingot, how many wafers do you know of can be cut from it? And then secondly, how many ingots per year might one of these units be able to do? And I just wanted to get a rough feeling for uh, megawatts megawatts of right. solar per machine per year. And if I learn something, I'll, uh, I'll bring it up on the show next week. But it looks like they're going to be RE plus, so we can go like touch stuff. Oh, cool. Yeah, and, and it says here the ingots are 300 millimeter diameter, you know, I think the industry is using 280 plus millimeter cells now, aren't they? The 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 bigger cells, they're squares though, but they're 212 is okay. for the bigger guys, and the smaller ones are like 188, I think. Gotcha. But yeah, and they're three meters long, 3.2 meters or 10 feet long. So long ingot. I had you know I I, I was. You know, this is very enlightening. I don't know much about ingot manufacture. Nothing. It's, it's definitely <laughs> the geek end of the spectrum, but very important, right? We need to make ingots here in America en masse so we can make solar cells and solar panels with American-made product. Uh, right now, the vast majority of the wafers are coming from overseas, like probably more than 90%. Uh, I've... I, I would say really close. I mean, it could be. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we don't I mean, make a lot of wafers in the U.S. Uh, not today, but it's coming, right? Yep. yep that story that, about Norsun, that's a wafer story. Um, Q cells, as we've covered, right, is is going to have wafer manufacture in Georgia. Yep. And. And then we have Norsun, who's exploring it. You know, uh, maybe and then our course, listeners can tell us how many wafers do you get out of a. It's 3.2 meter ingot. And then how does that translate into megawatts of solar or, or kilowatts? Um, question of the day. All right. What's next? We what gotta, is next? That's a damn good question. We got to hire. We got to start to consult with our, uh, our listeners. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um, Uh-oh. Objects detected in the vicinity of Clear Space One debris removal mission target. Okay, <laughs> this is funny. So um, it's not funny, but it's funny. Um, <laughs> so I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like ah, damn it. But that's funny. Uh, so so they're looking at an item and they're saying, okay, we're going to remove this item from space. It's a uh, we're going to test it. We're going to research it. We're going to figure out how to do it because we don't want all this debris around. Because all this debris will cause collisions and mess up, you know, humanity. So there's this, uh, you know, Tim, you've heard it. I think you've even mentioned it. There's this uh, this zero dawn uh, thing where, like, if we have a ca uh, cascading debris event where we could just encircle the Earth with trillions of little tiny pieces of crap and nobody's going to space and there's no, there's right. no uh, uh, geosynchronous anything. So... So they're trying to clean it up. And while they're trying to clean it up, the item that they're saying, okay, we're going to remove it from space, guess what happens to it, Tim? Gets hit by space debris. Yeah. So it's like, ah! space, space debris is a really big problem. And, and this, short, this story doesn't show the picture, but 
maybe that's the picture. Oh, space debris by the number. So here's a, a companion story. This is from the European Space Agency. Um, and I'll put this tab on screen, but uh, space debris by the numbers, it's, you know, you see that cloud, right? We have a bunch of satellites, which are not considered debris. They're functioning, or many of them are. And then there's debris. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Do they count active satellites as debris? I don't know. But obviously, when things crash into each other and break apart, second law of thermodynamics says things are going to just... Uh, get smaller and more numerous and that is then a problem for things like the space station or the operating satellites or in this case the satellite that's trying to catch the debris is now in jeopardy it is ironic but also telling of the scale of the problem right it's a big problem there's yeah. a lot of debris up there yes so and, you know we like to talk about space and i do think that there's going to be you know, I wonder how we're going to do it, but I do think there's going to be a space industry where we can, um, you know, I think we're going to literally make stuff in space. We're going to mine asteroids. And well, I think let's there's going to be John Weaver's knowledge of space. How many rocket launches since the start of the space age in 1957 have humans made successful rocket launches? This number surprised me. 300, no, 212. 6,410. Oh, wow. Okay. Of course. Why would I think 300? Well, We're getting a... serious about space. I mean, heck, SpaceX alone is doing a launch a month now, I think. Uh, they're doing a lot more than a launch a month. Look here. There's a, there's a whole website. How many launches by SpaceX in 2023? And how many um, satellites if... have these rockets placed into Earth orbit, John? That's the following question. All right. So, so here's the question for you, Tim. How many rockets has SpaceX so far launched in 2023? In 2023? Yes. I'll say 30. 58. Wow. 59 that Falcon 3. Wasn't a yeah. bad guess. <laughs> 53 Falcon 9s, 3 Falcon Heavies, and 1 Starship. Nice. Yes. So. Yeah, they're gearing up for Starship 2, I think. Uh, yeah, it's getting closer. There's going to be another launch soon. So. so that number, though, of satellites placed in Earth orbit is oh, 15,760. There's 15,000 satellites up there. And That's Elon cool. is putting thousands and thousands of more satellites uh, just yes. for SpaceX. I mean, uh, what is the Internet service called? Uh, SpaceX Internet I should know because I'm a subscriber. But I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't Starlink. use it. Starlink. I don't use it very often. Um, but it's a, it's a nice backup to have. I like it. Space. The it's no frontier. longer the final frontier. It's just the frontier, I think. It's like, yeah, we're just, we're doing it. All right. Uh, I, this is a climate change story. And um, I wanted to bring it up because I wanted to say the number out loud and start to talk about it um, relative to solar incentives. So, so the story is that there's a town yeah. 150 miles west of um, Seattle. And it's a, a native population, a population native to North America, and they're moving the town a hundred, about a mile away and up a hill that's about 120 feet above sea level. And the reason is that the town, the ocean levels have raised two feet in this region over the last X number of decades, centuries. And the people living here, which is a small native village, um, it's they're they're getting flooded out they in the story they talk about how first avenue which is the first street from the ocean it's no longer viable as a place to live it floods extensively every year for long periods and uh as well the rivers that are around this uh are much higher so they the 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 banks break um and and then at the end of it it's 460 million dollars to rebuild this city yeah. and um if uh if we start putting that type of number into the price per kilowatt hour of burning <laughs> gas yeah that's what that's cost. where i'm going this is where i'm going with it i'm, I'm trying to talk about this is severe yes sir that's that's where i'm aiming is i want us to start saying all right every town on the coast we need to add that cost to our price of gas to our price of coal 
because those numbers are what we're actually paying. We're just kicking the can down the street because we like to do that. So reality is that these numbers, um, you know, three cents, five cents per kilowatt hour, that ain't the price. You know, I have people who constantly say, oh, solar gets all these incentives. That's because they're just not paying attention to what's happening on Earth. The number of people that are literally just dying in their homes and that and these people who have to move their homes like the whole city has to get moved because it's in a flood zone it's just getting destroyed every year from giant waves so i you know this is just this is our reality and now we're in the mitigation because we have chosen to let it go too long we are now going to bear consequences this is consequence and this will keep happening so yeah, so this story by uh, CNBC, Katie Brigham, Brigham, thank you, Katie, it points out that there's another study that found that by 2050, we're looking at a cost of $100 billion of land being negatively impacted by rising tides. This is 650,000 parcels, $108 billion. That's real money. $100 billion is, is real money. Well, yeah. that hundred billion, a huge chunk of it's in Florida, and insurance companies are pulling out of Florida. It's happening now, dude. The value of people's houses are on very unsteady ground in Florida. Um, there's going to be some massive. Uh, as a Floridian who's dealt with it, it, it pains my heart. But seeing the way the insurance and the way the state's being run right now, there's going to be a hurricane that's going to cause some massive damage. And the federal and the state level insurance company, which now covers like half the houses or some obscene number, which would totally not be viable as a business. It's just going to get blasted and there's not going to be any money. And the state of Florida doesn't make money. And uh, it's... It's about to get there, – there's an event's going to occur and again, and we're going to be like, oh, there goes $3 billion of real estate that now can't be rebuilt because no bank will give it a mortgage in order to um, – and take the risk. So that's just going to get wiped off the books, and I'm wondering how the financial models are going. And that report that you're talking about there, Tim, I think that report is mainly focused on the southeast, southeast of the U.S., like North Carolina, South Carolina – uh, Myrtle Beach areas, all these low-lying areas. We got a nuclear facility, the Norfolk military base, North city of Norfolk, uh, Virginia, which is one of the most important manufacturing hubs in the United States, is constantly flooding. So, you know, big money. What this story reminds me of, too, is, is Peter Fikowski's analysis. I have an interview with Peter Fikowski, author of Climate Restoration, okay, coming out in a couple of weeks. Uh, he estimates that the solution to sucking the trillion tons of carbon out of the atmosphere that are up there is as simple as a billion dollars of investment per year. So we're looking at that versus a hundred billion in losses, right? And that's we're just that's just one little statistic tip of the iceberg thing when you think about the globe and all the communities that are going to be disrupted and the food systems. And then the mass migration, that's the real killer uh, scenario that I have. I mean, it just strikes a lot of fear in my heart. I'm not, I'm not generally a very fearful person, but mass migration is a scary thing because humans running into humans in unexpected ways leads to violence, right? We don't deal well with strangers showing up on our doorstep. We, we go tribal and uh, and the picks and shovels come out. Um, so, yeah, the answer is much cheaper, right? Like, let's do the solution now. Let's uh, the, the other solution that's been floated is nationalizing the fossil industry, right? Because the fossil industry, when it's a capitalist endeavor, is it is um, it is highly incentivized to keep pumping oil and keep burning natural gas, right? That's the, that's their raison d'etre, is to make money by selling carbon, right? That's what they do. And so there's no, there's, it's common sense that they're not going to stop doing it when there's a profit motive involved. But we could just capture that market with a, with a, with a thing called the government, right? 
nationalize it, keep it as a reserve for a rainy day or a day where there's no sun and wind, right? Very valuable stuff. Keep it for a rainy day. I'm good with that. And then deploy a bunch of wind and solar and storage and decarbonize the economy. That's the easy part, right? 40 gigatons, that's nothing. It's actually child's play compared to the thousand gigatons that are in the sky, a trillion tons. So we don't have time for any more stories. Unfortunately, John, we just ran out. I mean, there's always more time. We can. We just ran keep, out of time. We can it keep going most, if we want. Le, it, it is our least renewable resource, unfortunately. But uh, this has been really fun. I, I always enjoy talking to you and bringing our listeners such in, in interesting news about wind, solar, and batteries. And we covered all three. Well, we didn't talk too much about solar. We talked about ingots, I guess. Um, and we did talk about your solar project, which is a community solar project, I think, right? Uh, no, our, our solar project is behind the meter. This one is in um, upstate oh. New York, and it's behind the meter for a casino. And maybe I'll do an on-site show from the casino if uh, one of these days. Who knows? Oh, cool. Because uh, because it's an awesome project, and I got to go visit it. So uh, well, speaking knows? of casinos, we're going to RE Plus in Vegas. Come visit us at booth twenty two sixty nine. I'm going to have a booth for the Clean Power Hour. We're going to be recording in the booth. I think a lot of the slots are taken now, but we're going to be recording uh, all day on Tuesday and Wednesday, and then part of the day on Thursday. So. Reach out to me if you want to do a recording session on the Clean Power Hour. And check out all of our content at cleanpowerhour.com. Of course, give us a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify. Those are the only ones that really matter, unfortunately. And then tell a friend about the show. We love hearing from our listeners. We love gaining listeners, though. We can't speed the energy transition, which is our mission here, John, if we don't get more listeners. So that's what you could do, Mr. and Mrs. Listener. Just tell a friend about what a great show we have here. And how can our listeners find the commercial solar guy? Here, it's really hard. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm all around. Uh, commercialsolarguy.com. That's it. Uh, we have contact page. We have phone numbers. You can call me on my uh, office line. We have a new office automated phone system, which I'm trying to figure out. So if it goes to voicemail, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, commercialsolarguy.com is the best pace, place to find us. And, uh, and Tim, uh, what types of things should people reach out to you for if they wanted to do business in the solar industry? What mm. do you do besides these awesome podcasts? I am a professional coach and consultant to solar companies. This includes... OEMs, these are manufacturers of solar equipment, includes installers, it includes individuals and companies. I do coaching and consulting for solar and clean tech companies. Thank you for asking. Reach out to me at tim at cleanpowerhour.com by email or find me on LinkedIn. I am not hard to find. Unlike John Weaver, I am easy to find. But I want to thank you, my co-host, John Weaver, Commercial Solar Guy, for coming on the show. And thanks to all our listeners, Rick and Joe and Chris Letman. Good to see you. Hope to see some of you in Vegas in just a couple of weeks. I'm Tim Montague. Let's grow solar, John. <laughs>